Good morning. This morning in our worship service, we're going to be reminded of grace. Uh, Grace is what God has done for us, not what God enables us to do so we can fix ourselves, but grace is what God freely does for us, not because we deserve it, because we've earned it, but that God freely has chosen to save us. That's what's going to give our lives confidence and joy, is what we'll see this morning. I would like to take a moment and welcome those who will be watching the service online. Glad you're able to to, uh, join us that way. Uh, There is a a copy of the bulletin available on our website at goodshepherds.net. You're welcome to download that and follow along. Uh, The service is printed for you in the worship folder, and so we'll begin uh, with the opening hymn that's printed for you on page 3, hymn number 225. This This is the day the Lord has made. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Taste and see the
we pray. Lord God, you call us to work in your kingdom and leave no one standing idle. Help us to order our lives by your wisdom and to serve you in willing obedience through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson is recorded for us in Isaiah chapter 55. The prophet here speaks to, to us about what God does. He freely pardons. He does this through his word that works in our hearts, connecting us to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and make it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This is the word of our God. We'll continue by joining together to sing Psalm 118, and a psalm in which the psalmist reflects on grace. He tells us what he sees. He sees deliverance even in the midst of death. For God has saved us.
send me glad. For our second lesson, we hear God's word recorded for us in Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul here talks to us talks to us here about the reality of the Christian life. Sins freely pardoned because God's ways are higher than our ways, but we haven't attained perfection in this life. But knowing that our sins are forgiven, knowing what we have in Christ, we strive, we make an effort to live as God's holy people. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his <laughs> glorious body. This is the word of God. stand for the gospel lesson. This morning we hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus as it's recorded for us in Matthew chapter 20. After you get over the point that Jesus makes, God's not fair, marvel at the point that God is gracious. God doesn't give us what he deserves. He gives us what we don't deserve. This lesson will serve as our sermon text this morning. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to, said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered them, Friend, am I, not, am I be, not being unfair to you? Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who has hired the, the last the same as I gave you. 
Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We will continue continue by singing the first three stanzas of hymn 389. Grace and mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God which we will consider this morning as I just read it to you is the gospel lesson uh, from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. In the name of our triune God, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm probably not the only one who sometimes has bad ideas that result in problems in my own life. Here's one of them that was more harmless, true story in my life. About four or five years ago, the bank that I would go to had one drive-up ATM, but it had three inside the bank that you could walk up to. So it was much quicker to actually get out of your car and walk in, so I started to do that all the time. I would walk into the bank and save time. And one day as I'm walking into the bank, as I went through the door, and there were about five or six of us walking in the bank at the same time, the security guard who was standing outside the door, that's where he always stood, says, hello, Steve. And I just kept walking because I'm Tim. I'm not Steve. He's not talking to me. Didn't really think that much of it. Until about a month later, I was walking into the bank again. I was through the doors. There were only about three of us this time. And he said again, Hi, Steve. And I looked, and one of them was a lady who was walking next to me, and one was a Hispanic man, so I'm trying to do that. What are the odds that his name's Steve, as opposed to the odds that he thinks my name is Steve? About a month later, I'm walking into the bank again. This time, I'm the only person walking in. Coming across the parking lot, he's looking at me. I'm looking at him. As I get up to him, he says, Good morning, Steve. How are you? And I said... I'm fine, how are you? And well, oh, I just kind of admitted that my name is Steve. Why did I do that? And I went in, did my business, and as I walked out of the bank, he says as I'm walking across the parking lot, hey Steve, tell Lisa I said hi. 
I'm sure he was talking about my wife, whose, whose name is Holly. And I realized, you're just an idiot. Why did you do that? Why didn't you just say, no, I'm sorry, my name's not Steve. I just didn't want to embarrass him. He was a nice guy. And so then I had to start waiting in the line at the drive-thru because I was too embarrassed to have to walk by this guy all the time and pretend like my name was Steve. And I was just so annoyed with myself. What a terrible idea, what a terrible moment when if I had just said the right thing, everything would have been much simpler for me. The terrible idea, the terrible moment that Jesus addresses in our gospel lesson this morning is, well, it, it's far worse than my silly mistake at the bank. The terrible idea that Jesus addresses is that moment when we might be tempted to think or to say to God, hey God, be fair with me. Just give me what I deserve. It's a terrible idea, but it's very common. A lot of people want to think that way. God, give me what I deserve. One of the tragic problems of evil in our world is that it blinds us to the evil in our own lives. And we live with this idea that, yeah, if, if God was just fair with me, that'd be good. The problem with asking God to be fair with us is that if God's going to be fair with us, he's going to judge us, not based on the standard we've come up with, but based on his standard, his standard's perfection. And God's not going to be fair with us just based on the stuff we remember, the good stuff we did. It all goes on the table before him. Everything we've ever done. If we want God to be fair, he's going to look at everything. This terrible idea that we want God to be fair with us is is rooted in a denial of reality. It's rooted in these dreams we have that we're, we're really good people and that we've pleased God with the things that we've done. It's rooted in a false reality, a false reality in which try your best is all God really wants from you. And so I tried my best. I, I went to church as often as I could. I opened my Bible as often as I could. But we don't bother to think about the times when our excuses were just wrong. We made priorities that pushed God aside. We act as if, well, that's okay. Or we think that, that love your neighbor as yourself means love your neighbor when it's easy to love your neighbor. Or love the neighbors that are, that you, are like you. You know, the ones who have the right political signs in their front yard. But the ones who have the other political signs, well, those ones I don't have to be as nice to. Or those people who are different than me, well, I don't have to be nice to them. That's not what God has said. The standard for love your neighbor as yourself is not just when it's easy. Or sometimes we, we believe that sin is just the really bad stuff, not the stuff that I and a lot of other people do. If a lot of us do it, how wrong can it be? It must be okay. There's a lot of us doing it. And so being a little greedy or losing your temper every now and then, well, that's, that's just stuff that, that people do. Everybody watches this or that TV show or movie. It, what, how can it be wrong? My friends talk about it. And we live in this false reality in which we get to decide what's right and what's wrong. And then we think, well, if that's the standard, sure, God, be fair with me based on, on my standard. But if God's going to be fair with us, he will expose what lives in us. The sin and the rebellion, the selfishness, our unwillingness to help a stranger, but even our family or friends sometimes because we just don't want to, because we're too wrapped up in ourselves. God will expose the long gaps in our prayer life or the times when our Bible stayed closed for long periods of time or we didn't even think about going to a Bible class or church for a while because we just had other stuff to do. And that we think will be okay? No. If God's fair, all those sins come before him 
And as Jesus says at the very end of the parable, we'll end up being the last. We'll be the ones cast out of God's kingdom, the ones punished for what we've done. The better, obviously better idea for me would have been to say, no, you must be thinking of another tall guy with gray hair who banks here. I'm Tim, not Steve. That would have solved a lot of problems. The better idea for us is not to ask God to be fair, but to ask him to be unfair. Very unfair. Don't give me what I deserve, God. Give me what I, what I don't deserve. Be ridiculously unfair with me. The master in the parable from Matthew chapter 20 pays the people who worked one hour a full day's wage and said, I just want to be generous. Is that wrong? I want to be generous to these people. Why is that a problem? That's what we want from God. God, be generous to me. Be gracious to me. Don't give me what I deserve. Give me what, what you have graciously chosen to give me. As we heard him say in our, our first lesson from Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts, or my ways aren't your ways. That's what we want. We don't want God to think like we do. We want God to think like God does, guided by grace. Grace that, again, from our first lesson, we heard him say, will freely pardon Grace that will wash away our sins because his ways are higher than our ways. The grace of God, the undeserved gift that we get from God is that instead of being fair, he washes away all our sins, completely takes them away, washing us in the blood of Jesus Christ, whose crucifixion, whose death on the cross was, was the full payment for every bit of punishment we deserved for our sins, so that we are made righteous and holy. God's grace is based in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that allows us to say with, with the psalmist from this morning, I, won't, I will not die, but I will live. I will live because Christ is risen. And I will not be punished, but I will live forever in heaven because of Jesus. Instead of the terrible idea of fairness, what we want is for God to be gracious. And what we want to do is live our lives under that grace. Let grace be grace in your life. Don't try to mingle in a little bit of your works. Judge me by what I've done, God. Don't, don't ever think that. Because then it all goes on the table. And all the sins are there. Don't ask God to give you what you deserve. Let grace be grace and live in the peace of knowing that your sins are forgiven and that God truly loves you. Live in the confidence that grace gives. If we're going to be judged by what we've done, there isn't a lot of reason to be confident about what's to come. But if we live under grace, if we live under the generosity of, of a God who freely pardons our sins, we can live with confidence confident that God loves us. He has declared that he loves us. When we let grace be grace, that seemingly silly, difficult phrase in the Bible where God says repeatedly, don't be afraid, it actually becomes possible when you live under grace. When you forget about grace, there's plenty of reasons to be afraid. Afraid of what we've done our own failures, afraid of a world that's gone mad and crazy with sin. But when we live under grace, when we have the assurance that God loves us, sealed for us by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then we can live without fear. Then we can know that the God who saved us loves us and he won't leave us. He's promised to watch over us. He has to. He'll be at work in our lives. When we let grace be grace, we can live with all the joy that God wants us to have. All the joy that God wants you to have, even this year, even in 2020, with all the problems we've experienced. The Christian knows joy. Joy is that God loves us. God has chosen to love us, and God will not stop loving us. 
the troubles we've faced this year are not punishment. They can't be. The punishment for us was at the cross of Jesus Christ. He took it for us. God is testing and refining us as his people, drawing us closer to him, reminding us what's most important. That gives us joy to know that God loves us enough to be at work in our lives. Letting grace be grace makes us bold to carry out the ministry that God has given us here at Good Shepherds to carry out. It's not dependent on what we've done, how good we've been, but our ministry is based on the grace of God. We proclaim a Savior, Jesus Christ. Quite honestly, it's grace that lets us actually think about the merger that's being proposed between our various congregations in the area because it's not dependent on who we are or what we've done that it might work. But that merger would be based on the grace of God, a God who has, for 2,000 years, been busy blessing his Christian church as they strive to proclaim the gospel. And we can be confident that the God who has been blessing his church will continue to bless us. Letting grace be grace. Not trying to get what we deserve, but just being confident that we are God's people because of his grace. It has a powerful effect in the individual lives of Christians. In our second lesson from Philippians chapter 3, you heard Paul talk about that. He says in that second lesson, that, or he talked about what we have already attained. Think about that phrase for a second. What have you already attained? Because of Christ Jesus, you have already attained righteousness and holiness and perfection and the love of God. And so Paul can say later in that lesson that we are citizens of heaven. We who believe in Jesus Christ. Not will be citizens of heaven. Oh, there's more to come. Someday he'll transform our bodies to be like his, his glorious body. But even now, we are citizens of heaven because the Lord Jesus Christ has claimed us. And then in that lesson, he talks about what that means in our lives. He says that we will forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead. We will strive. We will make an effort to live as God's people. We will press on toward the goal. Or he says to live up to what you have already attained. Act as, a, act as the child of God that you already are because Jesus Christ has saved you. And no, Paul admits it in the lesson, you won't attain perfection. But that doesn't stop us from making an effort to be who God has made us to be, who God has graciously made us to be. Be his people who live with confidence and joy, who live with peace who are bold to do the work that he's given us to do because it's grace that enables us to do these things. Grace is not just some philosophical idea or theological truth, but it is the fuel that drives your life as God's child. Grace is the announcement that you are purified, that you are renewed. Grace is the, the assurance that God has given you gifts Unique gifts, a unique situation in which to use those gifts, but God has chosen how to bless you. God's grace is the best idea you could ever hear. It is the promise of God that for the sake of Jesus Christ, you are his child. You are forgiven in spite of all the things you remember that you actually did. All those sins are washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace is the cross of Christ. Grace is the water of baptism in which God sealed you as his child. Grace is peace and joy and confidence. It is living as, as his child. Don't settle for some terrible idea like fairness. That's the worst idea ever. You don't want God to be fair. But instead, cling to grace so that you can know you're God's child. And cling to grace so that you find renewed and daily strength to live as God's child. Let grace be grace for you in your life. Let it wash you, purify you. Let it, let it instill in you joyful service to your Lord. God's grace is what you need. God's grace is what you want. And so, brothers and sisters, 
Let grace be grace in your life so that you can live with peace and joy as God's child. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue on page 12 of the worship folder, joining together to confess the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we praise and glorify you for your unsurpassed gift, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We confess that we are unworthy sinners who have transgressed your will and your word. We repent of our evil and, and pray for faith that trusts completely in the righteousness of Christ Jesus for our forgiveness. Open our hearts to the mighty power of your word. Teach us to depend on your holy sacrament for spiritual strength. Grant that our minds may be renewed in righteousness, that our consciences may be stirred to choose the good, and that every thought, word, and deed may be brought into the captivity of Jesus Christ. Give to your church ministers and teachers who have the faithfulness and courage of the true prophets, that your people may be built up in faith, that they may abound in good works, that they may rejoice in your love, and that finally they may enter your heavenly kingdom. We pray, O Lord, for our beloved country. Give us citizens who perceive that the standard of what is right is not personal advancement or private favor, not public opinion or party platform, but your holy will. We pray that you would lavish your grace on all families, that each home may, may, by its Christian love and character, be for our children a foretaste of the joy and blessedness of our heavenly home. We pray for all, for all who are in any way sick, suffering, or in any pain, for all who are in any danger of body or soul. Teach them to turn to you and to wait on you for mercy. Grant them hope and a joyous deliverance from all their trials, and let them walk in your light all their days. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our refuge and our hope, and in his name we join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with the hymn on the next page, hymn, num uh, hymn from our supplement, number seven, 771.
Please stand. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. We'll close with hymn number 320. Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, welcome. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. We have a guest book uh, off to the left as you exit. Hope you'll take a minute to sign that. Uh, two announcements I want to highlight. First, Busy Hands is going to get started again. They will be meeting this week, having a, having a planning meeting on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, all the ladies of the congregation are invited to that. And then this, the, underneath that in there is an announcement about... Uh, I've, when I first show up at a congregation, I usually try to do visits with the congregation after a month or two. Well, after a month or two, we closed the whole world down after I got here. And I've decided, well, it's time to just try again. And we'll see if we can make it work. I know some people won't be comfortable, and I totally understand that. Uh, if you're not comfortable, I'll keep trying to do this for a while. But on the back table to the right of the back door, I, I set up some times when I could visit with people. And it's nothing formal. I just want to get to know people a little better here. Uh, so if, if there's a time that works on there for you, please sign up. You'll notice it says afternoon or evening. That's not a specific time. That's so you can tell me what specific time would work for you. I, I blocked out that time, and we'll make it work. But if it works for you, and we'll do this for a while. I know it's a bigger congregation. I can't visit you all in, in a month or two. Uh, but as we have time, uh, sign up there, and hope I'll get to, get to know you just a little bit better. <laughs> 